Welcome back to Sick Meets World. I'm Gerwin Singh Abuja, and I'm joined with my co-host, Sean Sanguman. For our second episode, Sean got to sit down with the first Sikh ever elected to a state congressional office, Manka Kaur Dingra. She is well on her way to a successful political career in the state of Washington. So, Sean, what do you guys talk about? Well, Gerwin, I was able to meet her at her office in Redmond, Washington, and have a really great conversation learning about her American story and how she even ended up in public office. Cool. Please listen to A Very Powerful Core on the second edition of Sick Meets World. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. What's it like being the representative from the 45th, which is Redmond and and the suburbs of Seattle, the high-tech suburbs of Seattle, home to a little-known company called Microsoft? Well, you know, I've lived in this area for over 20 years, so I really feel I have grown up with this area. It's changed a lot since the time when I moved here. Mm -hmm. So when my husband, Harjit, and I moved into this area, there was one Indian grocery store about 20 minutes away. And so my family from California, my mother and mother-in-law, every time they would visit, they would call me and say, oh, what kind of masalas should I get you? And so they used to get me my Indian groceries from California. And now if you walk into Redmond, Woodenville, uh, Kirkland, Sammamish, it is so diverse. Um, I have a choice of five Indian grocery stores five minutes from my house. And so the area has really changed. And so I actually am very proud to represent this area because I think it truly reflects my values and the way that I have developed as a human being having lived here for so long. Could you share with our listeners just your immigrant story? I have a, a an unusual immigrant story because my father actually went to USC and got his master's um, from California. Oh, wow. His uh, Masi and uncle have lived here since the 60s. And after he got his master's, he actually had the option of staying in the U.S. or moving back to India. And he and my mother had an arranged marriage. And my mother at that time did not want to live in the U.S. So he ended up back in India. And so I was born in Popa. Nice. And um, so I lived there till I was 13. And um, my father actually ended up getting colon cancer. And they, my parents came here for treatment because his parents, his sister, they all lived in California. Mm-hmm. So he ended up passing away. Okay. And uh, my mother was able to get immigration through the teacher uh, visa. And so we moved here and I went to high school in California. And then I did my undergraduate degree at UC Berkeley following in my uh, Master G's footsteps because he got his PhD from Berkeley. Yeah. And then uh, a lot of my cousins and brother were all UC Berkeley grads huh, in yeah, Berkeley. Absolutely. Well, before we get into Berkeley, I'd like to know, growing up in America during the 80s, what was it like being in California as a you know newly immigrated Indian? You know, um, it was unusual for me because I already had family here. Mm, sure. So when I was growing up in India, my bua, who was in um, Los Angeles, would actually just record hours and hours of... Um, the Disney TV show. And we would just get these cassettes from the U.S. and like care packages on a semi-regular basis. Oh, that's amazing. So culturally, when we moved here, it wasn't a culture shock. We came in, you know, with grandparents and buas and masis and everyone who's been here for a while. And then my friend, my father had friends that he had made when he was in college. So we came into a community, which was great. Yeah. But it's, you know, also a time when um, I remember this one incident when my grandfather and my grandfather loved buying American cars. So I grew up with Buicks because (laughs) he believed in buying American. And um, I remember one time he came home. We used to go to their house after school and he was really upset. And um, he finally told us that while he was driving, uh, someone who was crossing the street looked in and called him a raghead. And so, you know, I remember those stories. Um, my brother in middle school kind of struggled with some bullying because of his patka. A friend of his um, actually was another Sikh boy who joined 
uh, school a year after my brother did. And there was an incident where he ended up bringing a kirpan to school to fight the bully. Wow. Uh, so, you know, I grew up with that. Um, I have cousins who grew up in Texas. Sure. And, uh, you know, the whole, all the boys were uh, bugries. Mm-hmm. And so I was always aware of it was tough growing yeah. up at that time in the 80s in the U.S. I wanted to bring this up. And your Wikipedia stated that you met your husband while at Berkeley, which you had mentioned earlier. Was this a love marriage, a quote unquote love marriage? And if so, did you always want to marry a Sadar? <laughs> or, or was this by chance that it happened? So, um, you know, I know the Wikipedia says we met in Berkeley. I was at Berkeley. He was not. Uh-huh. It was a love marriage. Okay. Though extremely well approved by our family. <laughs> Conditional because, love marriage. Yeah. Uh, why, I actually met him at my brother's high school graduation party. Oh, see. His parents and my grandparents have known each other for decades. Gotcha. And um, his family had moved to Orange County back in the 80s as well. And so I've known his parents, but I didn't really know him very well. He was always the engineer who was in his bedroom during Indian parties, doing his own thing. Mm -hmm. So I knew his brother and I knew his sister. And he went away to college in New York. So he got his master's from RPI in Albany. And when my brother graduated high school, my brother's two years younger than me, her youth was back in California. And so he ended up coming to um, my brother's graduation party. It was a big one. And he asked me out. And... I was fairly shocked because I'm like, oh my goodness, he's Bibanante's son. And I was there for the summer uh, working at a law firm. And so I figured, oh, maybe we'll go out. It's a summer thing and, you know, we'll go our separate ways. So we started dating. Uh, my grandparents were thrilled. Uh, my mom, not so much. Oh, what's interesting. <laughs> yes, yeah, because she thought I was too young. Ah, I see. And, you know, you don't get involved with Indian boys seriously at a young age. And for me, it was a summer thing. I went back to Berkeley and I'm like, okay, bye-bye. And he used to work at that time at um, JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratories. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah. So when uh, school started, I moved back to Berkeley. And then he called me and he's like, hey, I would like to visit. And uh, I've always had a very open relationship with my mother. So I called her and I said, hey, he wants to come visit me. She went like dead silence. (laughs) And so I said, but that's okay. I'm going to break up with him because, you know, he's not in my five-year plan. Oh, I see. Two years later, we got married. (laughs) And that's how I moved to Seattle, actually. He, in the meantime, uh, he had joined a startup company with his friend. And they built these things called um, Actimates. And Microsoft bought their company. So he moved to Redmond. And uh, when I was applying to law school, he convinced me to apply to UW. And then I got in. And so we got married and we moved here. And originally, I always thought we were going to be here for three years. And then we would move back to California. Now it's been 20. It's been over 20 years and we love it. Uh, I just, I love your family's photo right on the about page of your campaign website. It, it to me, it, it, it epitomizes like the sick American family that we've tried to explain to Americans that as a, an immigrant community. And when I saw that, it brought a big smile to my face. And it also has our dog on Yeah, there. right. He's holding the dog. That's right. And the dog's name is Sheru Singh. Sheru Singh. Perfect. So definitely a very sick name for a very sick dog. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so after graduating from Berkeley with a degree in poly- political science, you founded API... Chaya, uh, not too long after, which is a nonprofit dedicated to domestic violence against South Asian women. Um, that's correct, right? That is correct. So uh, I actually come from a family with really strong women. My great grandmother was actually involved in, you know, fighting the British. Um, my grandmother and her sisters worked in refugee camps, and my grandmother's always done a lot of nonprofit work. And so growing up, we always gave back to the community. And I got involved in domestic violence while I was at Berkeley. I was volunteering at a place called the National Clearing House on Marital and Date Rape. And originally, I was more interested in date rape. And that's where I learned more about domestic violence. And um, then I started working at a shelter called The Safe Place. At the same time, Narika, which was one of the first South Asian domestic violence organizations in the country, was starting up. So I joined the board of Narika while I was at a safe place. And it was really interesting to me because 
a safe place was this shelter that was run in Oakland, California, mm-hmm. and had very strict rules and uh, was very well regulated because it was a shelter. We had formal intake forms. We had a phone tree. We had a security code to the shelter. And so I had gone through their orientation and was a volunteer there. And then at Narika, where we had you know, a group really of women putting together a program on how to help South Asian women. That's amazing. And so the cultural differences were so extreme, but it was very intriguing for me. So when I moved here, I had, you know, the background of both those organizations. I knew what I liked from one and what I didn't like from the other. So when I came here, I wanted to make sure I continued my work in domestic violence. And I reached out to many of the local organizations and I asked them, like, how many South Asian women do you serve? And the answer was consistent. We don't serve South Asian women. We don't think there's a problem in that community. And I'm like, no, that's not really true. And, you know, being new to the area, the one Indian grocery store that I mentioned to you earlier, sure. I yeah. actually put up a flyer saying, hey, want to start a South Asian domestic violence group? Call me. And I tried to um, network with some of the other advocates I knew. And there was a South Asian woman mm-hmm who was working as an advocate at a domestic violence organization. So we got together. She knew of a group of other women who were interested. And really, that's how Chaya started. Uh, Most of the meetings were in my house, in my uh, living room, mostly my kitchen, actually. And I took what I'd learned from a safe place, what I knew from Narika, and I combined the two. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things I did was make sure we don't call the older women aunties, (laughs) um, because there's a huge power differential right there. And it was really impacting the way the organization worked. And um, because I was in law school, I set up the bylaws and incorporated the organization. Um, advocacy was has always been my passion. And so we set up uh, the advocacy program. And so I was a volunteer advocate for years before we got the resources to hire people. Yeah. And I used to actually do a cultural competency mm-hmm. training for other advocates in the domestic violence community. So it was... It, it is. It's an amazing organization. Um, you know, I always talk about it being my firstborn. You know, I started. Which is in- going strong now. It's like a fully formed adult doing it- amazing things on its own. That's like a dream for National Sick Campaign. It is. You know, <laughs> so that's what I talk about. You know, when I had my kids, I left the board because I couldn't hand, you know, I couldn't uh, do so much. And to me, that was like, it's going away to college, leaving me and going. And then we merged with the API Safety Center. That was my baby getting married, and it's been a very, very <laughs> successful marriage. It gives me hope as a nonprofit founder trying to, you know, make it lasting and, and further kind of progress itself. Um, you talked about going to law school. You clerked with the state Supreme Court after graduating and later joined the King County Prosecuting um, Attorney's Office here. Now you're a senior deputy prosecuting attorney alongside being a state senator. What about law drove you to pursue this path? So I knew very early on I wanted to go to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to go to Yale for law school and that I wanted to be a prosecutor. Five-year plan. Yale didn't want me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. I love the concept that prosecutor's job is to do justice. Sure. And, you know, it's a very unique role being a prosecutor because you have a responsibility to the defendant to the victim, and to the community. It really is your responsibility to make sure justice is done. And it is a truly awesome burden. And I mean awesome in the traditional way of using that word. It is a huge privilege and an honor to have that kind of power. And it has to be used in a responsible way. And I can tell you that most prosecutors take that role very, very seriously. And for me, a lot of it was about making sure we're protecting victims. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the most vulnerable in our population, it's women and children. Mm -hmm. So that's how I became um, a prosecutor. I love working for the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. They really do such incredible work. And they've been on the forefront of criminal justice reform nationally. So um, I started there, always saw myself as a trial attorney. And um, after I had the kids, after I came back from maternity leave, I became a supervisor in our district court. At that point in time, we had this thing called mental health court that was starting. The first one started in Florida. We were the second in the country to get started. And so one of the jobs of the supervisor was to kind of 
oversee this program. Mm -hmm. And I was new to that. I wasn't aware of therapeutic alternatives. I think it's new to the culture of law enforcement. And I absolutely loved it because as prosecutors, we tend to see people at their worst. In a treatment court, you also get to see people at their best. And so I kind of took over mental health court and ended up creating the therapeutic alternative unit, mm -hmm. which is a unit that doesn't normally exist in a lot of prosecuting attorneys' offices, but it does in ours. So I chaired that unit, and so I oversaw the growth of mental health court, uh, started a veterans court. Uh, we also did a diversion program, and uh, I'm also one of the instructors at the crisis intervention training that our law enforcement get. So since the inception of the CIT program, I've worked with uh, our Criminal Justice Training Commission and training law enforcement, and then doing a lot of collaboration with law enforcement agencies on crisis intervention work. Incredible. You're very much an entrepreneur, if you don't realize it, from, from just seeing it afar, whether it's nonprofit or as a lawyer, you take opportunities and you make something out of that, which is awesome. And I wonder, how have these experiences shaped you as a politician? So while I did all of this work, I've been very involved in policy. Mm -hmm. So I loved working on domestic balance policy, mental health policy, criminal justice reform. And I'm not someone who was politically engaged. I never attended a Democratic Party meeting. My husband and I vote, and we once caucused, but that was it. But our um, election in 2016 really threw me for a loop. I was very excited that Hillary was running. Um, and, you know, I remember when Obama was elected, actually, uh -huh. uh, the Seattle Times had this front page where they had the pictures of all the presidents of the U.S. And I remember that morning opening up the newspaper and calling my kids over and saying, hey, take a look at the presidents of the United States. And my daughter was four, and she comes over, she takes a look at the newspaper, and she goes, where's the page with all the women? And so for election night, I was having a huge party at my house because I wanted to show my now teenagers the face of our first female president. And my husband still says it's because I opened the champagne at four o'clock. It's what <laughs> led to the result we got. But I was simply devastated. I never thought I could have the reaction that I did on an election. And it really made me realize that I had to do something. And I attended my first Democratic Party meeting in December. And then two things happened, basically. I actually had gotten involved in hate crimes after 9-11. We had a Sikh uh, cab driver who was assaulted in Seattle. And um, so, uh, Seattle Police Department had a, a Sikh Muslim Arab uh, advisory council that they had started at that time to try to get community input. And so I was the prosecutor representative uh, to this group. And so I've been involved in hate crimes for a while now. And in December, our local mosque in Redmond was having a safety forum. So I was there. We had six of our East Side police chiefs there. And we had this huge room full of people. And, you know, it was really eye-opening to me to really understand how scared people were. There were people talking about how they weren't sure that they should buy a house or they weren't sure whether they should get a car. They didn't know if they would be living in this country. And I remember thinking, I don't ever remember being that scared while I was growing up. Now, after 9-11, I used to always carry my law enforcement badge with me. You know, I always made sure that when we were traveling, the luggage was checked under my name, not my husband's name. So we did do things because it was challenge, uh, challenging traveling um, with a Sikh man with a beard and turban. But I don't remember being scared. Um, and two days later, the Indian Association of Western Washington had a hate crime seminar. And it was the same thing, a smaller room, but full of Indians. And I was hearing the same thing over and over again that families in Redmond, Sammamish, Bellevue, mm -hmm. the so-called most educated areas in our state, their kids were being told that they're going to get deported. And so it really was that weekend when my husband and I talked and we decided that our democracy has to represent each and every one of us and that I was going to run for this position. So it was um, a, a short stint from our election in November to me announcing in February that I was running for this position. When the seat opened, did you just jump at it? No, I didn't. I knew I wanted to get involved. 
I didn't know what that involvement would mean. Mm. And uh, so a friend of mine, Angela Burney, has been on the Redmond City Council for quite a few years, and I've known her for 20 years. So I called her and I said, let's meet for coffee. And she and I never meet for coffee. And so we meet uh, at this coffee place, and I sit down next to her, and I'm like, and I start talking to her, and she just says, stop. Are you thinking of running? (laughs) And I'm like, well, I, I would like to, but I'm not sure what or how. And she said, you have to run for the Senate. And the first thing out of my mouth was, I'm like, I'm not sure I'm qualified. And she started laughing. And she's like, you're the most qualified person I know. She's like, you're a senior prosecutor. You've lived in the community. You like, you run a whole nonprofit and now you're on the board of another. And um, so she kind of helped me connect to some of the other politicians. And once I got over the concept that I wasn't qualified, I was very excited about it. So uh, definitely had to be asked and convinced, but it's been an amazing journey. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure the decision to run is a lot easier than actually running. And one one question that I that immediately came to mind first is, you know, in Sikhism, Guru Nanak's in particular, he preached gender equality and the fact that men and women are equal. Yet, Punjabi Sikh culture is still largely patriarchal. As a woman who was running for office at that point, did you face any pushback from our community? I did not. And, you know, the the Sikhi that I grew up with was always based on equality. That's something that runs very deep in my family. And it's something that actually runs very deep in my husband's side of the family. Um, my father-in-law when they had kids, he used to change diapers. This was back in the 70s. And uh, my mother-in-law taught my husband to cook when he was growing up in California. So the equality is something that within our families definitely does exist. But I did not get any pushback from the South Asian community at all. Uh, And that's what the amazing part about running was. A lot of people, you know, always ask me or assume that was really hard running. The reason why it wasn't for me is because of the level of support I had. I had, once I announced, I had the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, I had the PTSA parents, I had the teachers, I had the kids, I had the mental health community, the domestic balance community, because my husband's in tech, we had the tech community and the South Asian community all behind me. It it really was amazing to see how all the community came together in support. So it's actually been fabulous. The happiness that you must have had when you won. I want to know that feeling. Where were you when you found out you won and and what happened that night? So we were having a huge election night party. Um, And I had, you know, my parents were here, my brother, sister-in-law, we were um, all here. And, um, you know, that predicted I would win. But Mm -hmm. given 2016, I don't think anyone could really assume we knew what was going to happen. It was chaotic. I've never seen so many people packed into a room. (laughs) And it was definitely very surreal. I think I probably processed it the next day. But the results came out and they announced right away. They called the election fairly quickly. And I found out because the entire room, there's this huge uproar. And so I didn't hear anything except the noise that everyone was making. And then they started chanting my name. Um... And so I assumed I had won. <laughs> so I was asking someone. With 55%, which is quite the feat in itself. Yes. And so I'd ask someone to confirm, you know, to make sure. You call the AP yourself? <laughs> <No>. Hey. <laughs> but it was great. And um, we had, um, you know, Joe Biden called me from his plane to congratulate me, which was great. Yeah. But it was an amazing evening. And it was just a continuation, really, of all the support that I felt from the very beginning. Any any reference or any thoughts on, on defeating another Asian-American woman who was running? You know, it was really interesting that the Republicans found an Asian-American woman to run against me. Yeah. And so I used to tell people, I said, 45th is going to have an Asian woman as a senator. It doesn't <laughs> matter who you vote for. You're getting an Asian, Asian woman as your next senator. And that was kind of cool to see. Right now, federally, excluding the judicial branch, the government is fully controlled by Republicans. We've, we've seen their policy agenda this past year or so. 
especially since you know Trump's election. Washington State has long been a state known for its gridlock. It was kind of a state that had always been you know red and blue, and you know, it was kind of like Virginia, where I'm from, where it was always a mix. But with your election, Democrats now have full control of both legislative chambers and the executive branch. What's the significance of having a democratically run government? I mean, we saw it a little bit with Obama, but because of the crisis, there wasn't as much policy that could have been done. Well, you know, frankly, that's why my election got the attention that it did. It was important locally because everyone here was so frustrated with the gridlock. This was the first year, uh, first time in years that they were not able to pass a capital budget. Mm-hmm. And there was, there was frustration at the local level. We had a lawsuit against the state saying we're not funding education. We have a lawsuit saying we're not taking care of our mentally ill individuals. We have a lawsuit about a foster care system. Really, the three most vulnerable populations have to go to court in order to get any kind of funding. Mm -hmm. So there is that real life issue with who are we serving and how we're serving them. Then we had, it was important statewide because it flipped control. And it was important nationally because of that control. And we wanted, people wanted to have Washington join California and Oregon and really being this wall of blue that would stand up to Trump. And, you know, now we talk about the blue wave that started on the West Coast that's going to hopefully flood the whole country. So it was important locally and nationally for that reason. And it really speaks volumes to the power of one vote. You know, people feel disenfranchised that they're not being heard. They don't have power, but they really do because my one vote changed the way policy is run in the state. We changed the way we govern. And so to everyone out there, I really want to make sure they understand that it is so crucial and important to vote, especially for the immigrant community. We have to make sure our voices are heard because if they're not, we're shut out. And this year, because of this one single majority, we were able to pass a Voting Rights Act. We were able to do reproductive parity. We passed net neutrality. We, um, I mean, the list goes on and on. We finally fully funded public education. We passed not one capital budget, but two, one from last year and one from this year. And, you know, the list goes on. There are these amazing progressive bills. And 98% of the bills that we passed were passed with bipartisan support. So the issue isn't that these are just policies that the Democrats believe in. These are good policies that need to come for a vote. And unfortunately, the party that's in the majority controls what gets on the floor. Once these great ideas actually come to the floor, everyone votes for them because it's the right thing to do. It is responsible and it creates accountability and transparency in our government. And I think that's what you get with a progressive agenda is that good ideas, regardless of where they're from, will get to come on the floor for a vote. I was reading a bunch of stories about you as I was researching this podcast. And one thing we have always focused on with the National Sick Campaign is to not p- put people down for not knowing about six or, or, you know, playing into negative storylines about hate crimes and being a victim mentality. In this our Seattle Times article, this is like soon after you had won, you said, and, and I quote, we ran a campaign based on values, not on hate, not on fear mongering, not on putting the other side down. Can you further explain what you meant by this? So I always believe I am a positive person and I believe you have to put out positive energy out in the world because that is how you bring people together. And so it was very important for me, given the attention that this campaign had, that anything from my campaign would be positive. And because that's what I believe in. You have to look out for your fellow community. You have to do the right thing and you have to be honest. And so I am proud to say that anything that came out of my campaign did not go negative. It was about strengthening communities. It was about bringing people together. And, you know, I had a teen campaign committee. I had teens who worked on my campaign before I hired all of my staff. And so those are the values we even shared with the teens. I had a document that said values of our campaign. And that was part of it was you had to be positive. You have to uh, do things based on honesty and helping the community. And I think that's 
why the campaign was actually really fun for me because it was this amazing experience that brought a lot of people together. And I think that is how we move forward. And that's the only way to move forward. And you have to give people something to vote for, not vote against. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the parallels between what Siki teaches you as a young person or, or just as a person and what your campaign had brought to the forefront are, are really in tandem. And I don't know ultimately why I think six need to get into public office, which we'll talk about further in a bit. But, um, you know, what were some expectations you had going into politics that turned out to be false? And what have you learned also that are, you know, to be true? So one of the things that really surprised me when I got to the legislature was the caliber of elected officials. I, um, had my cynicism about people who ran for office. And I was so pleasantly surprised to see intelligent, caring, thoughtful leaders. And uh, so that I, I really learned that there are some truly wonderful people who have run for office. There are people who shouldn't be in office, but um, especially in the Democratic caucus, I was very proud of many of the elected officials we, ha we have there. So that was definitely a pleasant surprise. I was fairly shocked about some of the things that are said on the floor. I have not heard so much racism or sexism until I heard what was said on the Senate floor. Wow. And I think people need to pay a lot more attention on what the elected officials are actually saying, because most people don't know it. Yeah. We have TVW that records a, a us every single time on every committee hearing, everything on the floor, but people don't hear it. And I think if they did, I think a lot of people would be voted out of office as they rightfully should be. This should make C-SPAN a little more exciting. Like get, get some new camera angles, like make it a little more zesty. I think people would watch. It's certainly like reality television, but I get, I get what you're saying. And especially uh, if they do sound bites. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Clearly domestic violence, mental health, some of the issues you've already talked about, what you've already done in office those have driven your policy goals. What inspires your next policy goals and aims? So I really do believe that in order for us to be successful as a community, we have to invest in our youth. You know, uh, being a prosecutor for over 18 years, I have really seen so many young adults, especially those from 18 to 26, where you look at them and you go, you know, they're in the criminal justice system because we as a society have failed them. So I really believe in making sure we're investing in our children as early on as possible in a very holistic way. For many years, I've actually been working with the Center for Court Innovation on risk needs responsivity tools. It's really about making sure you understand the person you're dealing with and how we address their needs and risk levels. In America, we use our jails and prisons quite frequently. Too frequently. And, yes. And there are alternatives to that. And that really means understanding the human being. Because if you know what someone's needs are, you know what their risk factors are, and then you can decide how you can address it. And what you find over and over again is that if you have a good plan to address the needs, the risk factors go down. And so we have to be looking at what are alternatives to incarceration. Use incarceration when you need to keep the community safe but use all the other options you have in order to make sure you are providing for that individual to make sure they're no longer a risk to the community. Now, these tools can be actually used for our children, the non-forensic ones. So when that preschool, that kindergartner comes into school, let's make sure the school knows, do, does this child see domestic violence at home? Do they have mental health issues at home? Do their parents use drugs? Is this a child who speaks English? Is this a child who gets breakfast? Once you understand the needs of the child, once you understand what the risk factors are, then we can make sure we have an individualized plan to make sure that child is successful by age 18. And if we do that investment in our children early on, it's going to pay off tenfold by the time this child is 18, because they will not be utilizing the criminal justice system. They will hopefully not be utilizing, you know, homeless shelters or emergency rooms because they're prepared for adulthood. So I would love to see us actually move to that model of taking care of our citizens and residents. And that includes making sure that they are ready for adulthood. And for many people, that means college, but for many others, it doesn't. So really making sure we understand what does it make mean for this child to be successful and making sure our schools have the resources they need to do that. Doesn't mean they 
can't have partnerships with nonprofits or corporations, but really making sure we're being deliberate in how we as a society are raising our youth. And I'm assuming, and this is presumptuous, but you're not a fan of Betsy DeVos and what the Department of Education is doing within the Trump administration. Absolutely not. I think you have to just look around the country to really understand that a fully funded public education system is the foundation of our democracy. And when you start having cracks in that foundation, we should be scared for our entire society. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one of the reasons why people historically have moved to America. It's because this dignity in labor, because it's everyone has the equal opportunity to succeed. And if you start chipping away at a fully funded public education system, that is what is on the chopping block. So we have to make sure we are protecting a fully funded public education system in this country. I don't want to talk about Trump too much. Uh, there's enough opinions out there on, on what he does. But I do want to know what you think about six in the United States who support him. For me, it's sometimes hard to fathom what's the reasoning. But you as a person, as an elected official, what do you say to people in our community who who uh, like support what he's doing? I, I really have no words. Um, there's a lot I don't understand about the women who support him, the Indians that support him, the Sikhs that support him. And, you know, people, that's what's great about this country. You have the right to choose and support whoever you want. But to me, you know, if you value equality, if you value respect, honesty, that's a hard one to reconcile. All those values you kind of talked touched on right there, clearly their, their focus is within the religion. How has the religion helped you as a person, first, and second, now, as a, an elected official? So the values definitely come from the religion and from my family. Though I will say we're not a very religious family in the sense of, you know, I never grew up going to the Gudvara every Sunday. Mm -hmm. We used to go for... You know, special occasions and off and on. My grandparents went to the Gudvara every weekend. Yeah. Um, my husband grew up going to the Gudvara every weekend. He's an atheist now, by the way. Okay. Um, but he still keeps the pogrom. Oh, he's the perfect Sikh other than <laughs> the not believing in God because he's vegetarian. Interesting. He doesn't drink. Wow. He wears a pogrom and doesn't but cut his hair. The best thing about Sikhism is that there is no one way to God. Exactly. Everyone has their own path. Exactly. And he believes in generosity and he's the kindest person who doesn't believe in violence at all. Mm -hmm. So he really is epitome of what Sikhism stands for, except he doesn't believe in From violence. a secular perspective. From a secular perspective. Um, so so I, I feel like I grew up with the Sikh values without necessarily having the religious... Um, structure around them. And that's what Sikhism is based on. It's in you doing what you need to do to feel closer um, to a higher power. And, you know, for me, a lot of it is when you look at organized religions is who's in control, who's running the show, and what are they saying? Because not, necess not the people in power, they don't necessarily talk about equality among human beings or among genders. And so, you know, we picked and chose when we went to the Gudvara and who was speaking at the time, mm -hmm. because unfortunately, not everyone subscribes to the equality that our religion is based on. Yeah, I certainly understand that. And one question I want to build on that is, you know, your kids are growing up in a multicultural world. They have plenty of different influences, whether that's YouTube or, you know, whatever it could be. Um, but you've raised them sick, I'm assuming, or in, in some form or fashion, they know about the religion, they go to Gudvara. What are one of the one are the one or two tenets of Sikhism that you have to impart on them uh, so that they can carry it through their lives? To me, really, it's honesty, um, equality, and compassion. But um, you know, it's really interesting. When my son was born, my husband and I had a long discussion on what are we going to do with his hair. Which mm. every Sikh family has that conversation. Absolutely. And um, I wanted him to wear a pagri. Uh, that's everyone in my family does. That was important to me. And I remember sitting uh, in my living room. My husband was there, my brother who was a pagri, and my two cousins who grew up in Texas. And all four of them had stories upon stories in middle school and high school and elementary school of being bullied and how hard it was. 
And all four of them said, you know, I think you should not have him wear a punk ring. And so I gave up and I said, you know what? You're the guys who went through it. Fine. If that's what her teeth you want to do, we can cut his hair. So we had cut his hair. And then when he was four, we actually went to India for a wedding. Mm -hmm. And we went to Amritsar. And we come back and my four-year-old says, I don't want to cut my hair anymore. And so he made the decision to grow his hair out. And so he wore a patka until he was in seventh grade. That's amazing. And then in seventh grade, I started noticing a change in his um, social structure. Like girls were kind of giving him weird looks. He started losing some friends. He was teased a couple of times. And going through security in airports was getting tougher and tougher. And so my husband and I spoke to him and we said, you know, what do you think if we cut your hair? And he didn't want to be different because the rest of the family, we all have long hair. And so I told him, I said, you know, I'll cut my hair and you cut your hair. That way we do it together. And let's just try it for a year. And if you don't like it, you can always grow it back. So he and I got our first haircuts together. That's amazing. Wow. Um, Because it's not fair for me to ask my son to do it when I haven't done it. Yeah. Um, So we did that. And um, I still struggle with it, but, you know, that's that's the reality. Uh, we as Sikhs wear our identity in front, and in today's culture, it's harder and harder to do that. And it's a decision we made, mm-hmm. and I think we're all fine and happy with our decision. Yeah, sure. so, um, so, yeah, so the kids go to Gudwara, they understand Seva, and uh, they understand humilities and honesty is huge for me. Yeah. Uh, my mom beat it in me that your ego is less than God. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's an incredible story. And a question I want to build up regarding, you know, awareness is, do you think your constituents now know more about Sikhism or your colleagues that you work with? Do you think that they have a better understanding now that you're an elected official? Or is it still kind of like you have to explain it? Well, um, you know, All through school, like I would always go into the kids' classrooms and do a Sikhism 101 training. I have a PowerPoint presentation and everything. (laughs) That's awesome. And definitely, you know, pictures of the Golden Temple and really let them know it's real gold. Yeah. So I've always done that through the kids' school. Um, I actually used the CELDEF training for law enforcement officers after 9-11. So I've done that through our office. So I think absolutely, anytime you're out in public or hold any kind of position of authority, having that conversation and letting people know is really important. And I've had my staff on the campaign staff who went to the Gudwara and they loved it. Mm -hmm. Um, And actually they asked me recently whether we should go back. I'm like, absolutely. (laughs) Um, So absolutely. I think the more we're out there, the more we create awareness. Yeah. And just having, you know, your husband on stage with you is, is that's in itself a visual that can't be, you know, disregarded anymore. I mean, I think there's so much power to that. And, you know, when I decided to run or we decided to run as a family, he said, he's like, you know, maybe I shouldn't be in the family photo. And I'm like, absolutely not. This is our family and you're going to be in all my material. And he has been. You know, there was racism that we dealt with Mm -hmm. uh, during the campaign. Mm -hmm. And um, the other side definitely used his image, I think, in racist ways. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it goes back to the fact that this community really is a very highly educated, high-tech industry who was not going to buy into that uh, racist narrative that the other side was trying to plug. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Who were some of your mentors that, you know, helped you along the way get to where you are now? Oh, so many. You know, (laughs) none of us go on this journey on our own. Sure. So I think it starts off with, you know, really my family. Um, from the very beginning, being there, uh, I would say, you know, even actually at the prosecutor's office, uh, Dan Satterberg uh, has been a really amazing boss and mentor to have with his vision of the criminal justice system and what that means. And, you know, I love books and authors. And really, I think there are mentors all around us if we're just willing to open ourselves up. Yeah. Uh, just regarding six in Canada and the U.S. who are going to national politics, whether it's Harjit Sajjan or you know all the PMs who are, are surrounding Trudeau, and uh, here in here in America, Ravi Bala, who's now the mayor of Hoboken, and what do you say to to them? 
you know, as someone who's also, that's your cohort, I would say, and then, you know, future sick leaders? You know, I think it's really amazing. It's been truly incredible to see the rise of so many um, Sikhs abroad. It's, it's really wonderful. But to me, you know, it goes back to the point you had made early. I think our religion and the values is really set up for us to be leaders in this realm and really lead with our values, which aren't just Sikh values. These are American values. These are values that all of us believe in. And I think that's why you're seeing that, just being able to have that conversation with honesty about what we need. And especially for Sikh women. I mean, we grew up you know, seeing images of Sikh women in the battlefield centuries ago. And so this image of a strong Sikh woman has been around for a long time. So I really hope to see a lot more Sikh women in politics taking on leadership roles. So to kind of conclude all this, how can other Sikhs or just people that, you know, maybe immigrant communities do what you have done, what would you recommend to them? What would be next steps if you were interested in, in reaching this, this So I've been, you know, I've been telling people that we need to have a seat at the table mm-hmm. and we just have to stop wait. We cannot wait to be invited. We really have to open that door, pull out that chair and sit mm-hmm. down and make sure we leave that door open behind us so that others can follow. But we don't need to be invited. We should just make sure we go after what we want. Is there any obstacles or hesitations or anything that you had to face as someone who is brown as a woman as a sick that you're like watch out for this any are there any watch outs that you want to share with the audience Um, my entire life (laughs) (laughs) you know i was a i was a sick woman prosecutor at an early age i i trained law enforcement in crisis intervention there's stories upon stories upon stories on how you you know over you know overcome racism and sexism and unfortunately that is what a lot of women in my generation have grown up with and i think you just have to overcome it the best way you can and be positive about it one of the stories that i actually have mentioned a few times and i do it because it's a little funny um was you know as i mentioned i'm one of the instructors at the 40-hour crisis intervention training at the criminal justice academy uh, in Washington. And after I'd been an instructor for a few classes, I wanted to take the whole 40 hour class myself. So I go to a new session and I decide to sit at the back of the room because, you know, I'm not an officer. I want, you know, all of them to be in front. And this is this big stadium style seating auditorium where the class is held. And I'm in the back row and it's all male. Mm -hmm. And in front of me are these three or four officers who clearly know each other. Not quite sure they're really motivated to be there. And one of them turns around and says, hey, honey, can you get me a cup of coffee? And I look at him and I go, no, I don't think so. And after 10 minutes, he gets up to get coffee. I'm like, hey, can you grab me a cup of coffee? And he gets me a cup of coffee. (laughs) And the guy who he was with, he's like nicely done. And the next day, I go to the front of the class and I do my presentation. He hadn't realized that I was a prosecutor. And so he comes up to me. He's really sheepish. And he goes, hey, I hope you realize I was just messing around. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. And then he spent the rest of the week being really, really nice to me. But to me, it's like, you know, just kind of standing up for yourself, making sure you don't um, get discouraged by what you hear and see and making sure you overcome it. So there are lots of things, you know, especially when I first started with these... um, old white attorneys coming to me and saying, did you run that by your supervisor? Does he really know what you're doing? Do you need that approved by someone else or assuming I'm the clerk or the paralegal and not the attorney? I mean, it goes on and on. And that just is reality, unfortunately. Hopefully the next generation won't have to deal with a lot of this. But you see that at every turn. Well, hopefully with with how 2018 is, is, you know, heading and trending and the Me Too movement and all this awareness that's finally happening, this will not be as much of a prevalent issue as, as it is. You live in Redmond, Washington. This is the center of change. How will the world be different in six years or four years or two years? I don't know how, how, how much things change. And, and what are you doing as an elected official, as a mother, as a you know prosecutor to prepare for it? So um, my grandmother is still alive. She's 93. 
She still lives in Bhopal. And she Skypes with the family on a regular basis and emails us and checks me out on Facebook. When she was born, there was no electricity. There was no um, sliced bread. And so if you look at the technology investment, investment, I mean, advancement in her lifetime, and you look at now, it's exponential year by year. My husband works at SpaceX. Um, So... Our understanding of what our life is going to look like in two years, in six years, it's going to be dramatically different. I don't know whether in 10 years we're going to have houses with garages because we may not need to own a car because we have autonomous vehicles. Um, So life is changing at a very uh, quick pace. I think as elected officials, we have to be forward thinking and forward looking and making sure we have the ability to make changes in order to understand and accept the technologies that's coming down. We also have to be realistic about what that means. Does this mean we're going to need bus drivers anymore? Do we need truck drivers anymore? What does it mean for our population as to how they can have jobs? What industries will they be able to work in? What's going to happen to manufacturing? So I think there are a lot of really tough challenges ahead for us. We really have to figure out how we as a society are going to react to these new technologies because they're coming and how we are going to form ourselves and construct ourselves uh, for the future. So I think it's a very exciting time, but it's going to be a time with a lot of change. I think as the state senator from the 45th, you should have like a hotline to Satya Nadella. The CEO, like at Microsoft. <laughs> well, uh, you know, my husband was at Microsoft for 19 years. Okay. We have a lot of friends who are so you got the, scoop. the cutting edge of technology. Um, and with him being at SpaceX, and there's just fascinating stuff coming down the pipeline. So what's next for State Senator Manka Dingra? Well, winning this uh, re-election campaign. And I'm really excited to see how we can fulfill this vision I have of an individualized success plan for each of our children. Any plans to go national in the near future? Oh, we'll see. Oh, we'll see. Okay. (laughs) All right. Any final words? Any topics or activities you want to talk about? Plug? Anything you want to share? You know, I really do want to talk about the team campaign committee. I had mentioned it briefly. Um, So last year we had about 100 teenagers that were working on this campaign and 40 of them that were here on a very regular basis. And it was really amazing to me to see how plugged in they were. And really to see their growth from the time they started with us to the time the campaign ended. By the last few weekends, we used to get anywhere from two to three hundred people a day to come out to doorbell. And the last uh, uh, two times, the teens are the ones that launched these uh, canvases. They would prepare the material, they would do the presentations, and they would send people out to canvas. And this year, they're the ones who were emailing me and texting me, wanting to get started on the re-election campaign. And so I told them, I said, this year, because of the growth you guys had last year, I want this to be a teen-run campaign. So I have a campaign manager, but there are all these teens who are signing up to really take on um, big roles on my campaign. And so we don't want to just have them do this work. We actually want to develop a lot of their talents. So I have someone coming in who's going to come in and talk to them about press releases and marketing. She used to handle Bill Gates back in the day at Microsoft. Uh, We're going to do other projects around the community and really engage them and give them a holistic experience of being in the public realm. So I'm actually really excited about that. And the energy and enthusiasm they have is is really so inspiring. That's incredible. And, And just for everyone who's listening, we are in the campaign office surrounded by water bottles and chewy bars. So I feel like you're going to have an army here in, in Redmond ready for ready to conquer. Actually, the hashtag they use is Munka's army. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and the first thing they did is they said, your Instagram account is not cool enough. So they have their own. So it's called Teens for Munka. Nice. And um, it, it really has been fascinating to see them. And what I love is how diverse the teen campaign committee is. It really is such a pleasure to take a look at the photos that I have on my Facebook page because it really truly reflects the America that we see. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me and in this podcast. It's been an honor. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, 
please rate and review the podcast on iTunes. Subscribe to Sick Meets World on your favorite podcasting platform and share it with your friends and family. Stay tuned for our next episode, which comes out next month. And of course, be sure to check out the National Sick Campaign website for more information.